thrilling to the conversation Dr John Puntis, the co-chair of the Keep Our NHS Public campaign, also a retired NHS paediatrician. Uh, John, good to speak to you this morning. Thank you for your time uh, on the show. You heard what David was saying there. He says this is a pragmatic uh, approach. It puts patients above ideology. Uh, what's your sense of it? Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I think it's a very regrettable move, and it actually shows an ideological obsession with, with outsourcing now, we know the NHS is in a mess at the moment, and this is why people think perhaps if I go privately or perhaps if we use the private sector, things will get better. But, you know, rational policymakers should really be asking what can we do to make healthcare work properly? And, and why have things here got so much worse, given that we were consistently rated as number one in comparisons of uh, the 11 most advanced uh, healthcare systems in the world until about 10 years ago. Uh, and the answer to what's gone wrong, I think most health experts or many health experts agree is chronic underfunding and chronic lack of uh, planning and, and particularly now the uh, the huge staff shortages. So, um, you know, this is like uh, my house is being threatened by uh, a forest fire and I, I'm given a, a fire extinguisher. That, that's not what I want. The only thing which I think can really secure good long-term health care uh, efficiently and provide good access to everyone is a properly funded public system. And diverting money to the private sector is just no answer at all. But isn't it the, we could, they're slightly separate issues. We can have a debate about whether the NHS is getting the funding it needs, and many people would say it still needs more. But in the meantime, we've got almost 8 million people waiting for treatments, waiting for diagnostics, waiting for scans, and so on. If you're one of those people, you just want to be seen as soon as possible. You don't really care, do you, whether it's by a private doctor or an NHS one? Well, I think you want to be dealt with quickly, no question about that. But where do the staff come from? I mean, the private sector have 17,500 uh, doctors, but they work in the NHS as well, and they were trained in the NHS, uh, and the costs had been paid uh, by the NHS for training them. And there is a limited pool of staff, and the same with diagnostic centres. And the National Audit Office pointed out last year in their report, looking at the surgical hubs and the diagnostic centres, uh, well, where does the staff come from? You know, if you move them from NHS hospitals, they're not working and doing stuff in those hospitals. The impact is very unclear. Also, the private sector does not train staff, so it recruits people who've left the NHS. And there are 170,000 people who left the NHS uh, last year. A lot of that to do with overwork and low pay, of course. So the idea that the private sector has this spare capacity, I, I'm doubtful about. I mean, I think that's the kind of answer you come up with if you, if, if you, uh, if you put together the kind of um, task force that Richie Sunak did and you fill it with people from the private sector. But, you know, you have to remember that uh, the private sector transfers over 6,000 patients a year back into the NHS because of complications. And, and we heard all this uh, as well during COVID when the private sector were going to come to the rescue of the NHS. They were given big contracts and they actually did 49% uh, less work than they, they did in the pre-COVID years with the NHS. So I, I'm very sceptical about there being this uh, reserve in the private sector, which is just waiting to come and help the NHS. I don't think it works like that. And your suggestion is, John, then, that rather than this being a genuine solution to a growing waiting list, you think this is driven by, what, ideology? Yes, and we, I mean, just yesterday there was a report on uh, uh, um, public sector contracts in relation to uh, education of youth offenders, um, prison food, care for asylum seekers, again saying that they're all failing. Uh, you know, this is Whitehall's own examination of what's going on. Uh, and the idea in general that the private sector is leaner, meaner, more efficient, develops and delivers a better service, I think doesn't bear close scrutiny. You know, they are um, profit maximizers, not cost minimizers. That's, that's what they do. That's the nature of a private business. Uh, now, of course, they can develop their capacity 
uh, if you throw money at them, but only by pulling in staff from the NHS mm -hmm. and further undermining NHS services. It would be much better to put that money into the NHS and develop the NHS and to take it back to, to where it used to be, num number one in the league table. Mm -hmm. Just just last year, in a sentence, if you would, because we're out of time, but would you ban NHS doctors from doing private work on the side? Uh, no, I wouldn't ban them. I, I think that would be... Uh, counterproductive, but I need. I think it needs to be highly regulated. Okay. And I would point out the private sector generally mm -hmm. is not well regulated and okay. it's unsafe for patients. Good to speak to you. Really great for your time this morning. Thank you. Dr John Punt is co-chair of the Keep Our NHS Public campaign, also a retired NHS paediatrician. Two different perspectives there. One, a John saying it's uh, not the way to go, that it's ideological. David saying this is just pragmatic and the best way to get people care as soon as possible.